I'm going to give you a gold market update. I'm going to talk a little bit about equities at the end as well. Um, Patrick specifically asked me for my insights into why gold mining equities haven't quite lived up to the performance that we've seen of gold companies too. But I'll kick off by, by talking about a very brief look back in 2023, because the, what happened last year is really important in terms of where the gold market is now. We'll talk about what's happened so far this year, and then specifically, I think you'll be most interested in the comments I'll make about tactical thinking before I touch on gold companies. Gold had a good year last year, outperformed most assets, except for US equities. But this year, year to date, and I've had to update this chart every day for the past eight days, as gold has continued to hit a series of record highs, gold has been the best performing major asset out there. It's hit highs not just in US dollars, it's hit highs in every currency that we track. And I think that's really important. Sometimes gold is strong because the US dollar is weak. The strength we've seen this year, and to a large extent last year, has taken place in a backdrop of the US dollar being strong. So if you've owned gold in dollars, you've done well. If you've owned gold in other currencies, you've probably done even better. I put this chart up here to demonstrate one of the tools that we have available on our website, Gold Hub, which you can get for free, gold.org. It's an attribu attribution model. It tries to show what's been driving gold in the short term on a month-by-month -month basis, the various factors that are at play. What I would say, however, is there are some big gray bars there, which mean our financial models can't explain some of the performance in gold. And if I'd have showed you the one in April, it would be off the chart. There's lots of things that have changed in the gold market over the last two years, over the last 12 months, over the last four months, and then over the last seven weeks. And I'm going to attempt to explain those uh, as we go on. The scene was set in 2023. We had record high gold prices around the world, and yet gold demand stood up really well. Exclude central banks, because I'll talk about those at the moment. Central banks have been really strong and really important. But even excluding central banks, gold demand strong. Bar and coin demand, strong. Jewelry demand didn't fall despite the strength in the price. That's really interesting to me. The only area of weakness that we can see on this chart is exchange-traded funds, and I'll come back to that later. When we spoke about central bank buying for 2022, we called it colossal, because it was over 1,000 tons. The gold market's about 5,000 tons a year. Central banks have been buying about 500 tons of gold a year since the global financial crisis. In 2022, they more than doubled that. In 2023, they kept buying. They're still buying. Who's buying? Almost all of the buying is coming from emerging markets. China is the biggest reported purchaser of gold, followed by Poland, and then Singapore, which is not an emerging market anymore. The interesting thing to me is China is really important. We have a central bank team that speaks to basically all the central banks of the world about gold. The, the question that they probably ask the most when we talk to them is what is China doing? China has the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world. They have 4% of their reserves in gold. Average central bank's about 15 to 20%, depending how you define it. So China is really important. When they're buying gold, that's a big signal. And Singapore is a big signal for its region. All the countries in ASEAN, Thailand, Malaysia, etc., they all want to turn into Singapore. The fact that Singapore is buying gold, really important. So this is mostly an emerging market story, and they're reporting large purchases. But they're also, central banks are buying gold and not reporting it. So these bars here show the quarterly numbers of central bank purchases over the last couple of years. You can see when the expansion of purchases took place in the middle of 2022. You can also see that most of this is being unreported. Now, we know this 
through our contacts in the gold market. We know this through our data providers, Metals Focus. We know this by speaking to the banks that are trading with the central banks. The buying that has been reported is big enough. The unreported buying is really large. So, where's backwards? There we are. So why are central banks buying gold? They're doing it for a number of reasons. As I said, they've been buying gold since the global financial crisis because during the global financial crisis, central banks recognized the benefits of having gold in their portfolio. At the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1971, developed market countries owned all the gold. Emerging market countries didn't have any foreign exchange reserves. They didn't have any gold either. But emerging markets have bought trillions of dollars of foreign exchange reserves over the last 20 years, and they hadn't bought much gold. So, recognizing the benefit, they started adding gold to their portfolios. But something happened in 2022 that made them much more aware of gold than they had been before. Part of it was the inflation burst that we came through and seeing how gold performed during various uncertainties. But a large part of it came down to the sanctions that were placed by the West on the Central Bank of Russia. Countries think often of, of central bank reserves as a pile of cash that you can use when you need it. But it isn't that. It's a pile of claims that you have on the financial systems where you have that money invested. Whether it's the US, whether it's Europe, whether it's the UK, whether it's Japan, etc. And if you do something that upsets the Western powers, you lose access to your foreign exchange reserves. But you don't lose access to your gold. Russia had more than 20% of its foreign exchange reserves in physical gold in Moscow and still holds that and controls it today. One of the things we do with our central bank team and our, and our central bank relationships is we have dinners and surveys. And, um, but the dinner we had back in, the, in October 2022 in New York, we asked a question in a room like this after a few glasses of wine. So. How many of you are thinking about your central bank reserve composition following the sanctioning of the Central Bank of Russia? More than half the room put their hands up. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing a big increase in central bank purchases. I think the, the final one is per perhaps more subtle. And again, it comes out of the surveys that we, we, we get from when we speak to our central banks. They're done anonymously, but we publish the aggregate of results. Are you thinking that the world is moving away from a single reserve currency, effectively, the US dollar, towards a multipolar world? Are you thinking, in other words, that the US dollar will lose its prime dominance and that other currencies will become more important over time? That's a very common answer we're getting. But as a central banker, you don't really want to own renminbi. You don't want to own Indian rupee, etc. Because they're not liquid currencies, they've got capital controls, you can't really spend them anywhere. You can spend dollars anywhere, as we know. You can spend euros everywhere, but these new currencies, which will become increasingly important in decades to come, aren't ready yet for massive central bank reserve deployment. But gold is. And if you think about who's buying the gold in the world in terms of consumption, it's all the emerging market currencies that you want to be exposed to. So in a way, it's a natural hedge. That's probably the, f uh, the next reason. So central bank demand has been a big story in the gold market since the middle of 2022. I'm not going to run through our outlook very much, mainly because, and this comes back to, I think, some of the issues that we've had about modeling, is it didn't really work. We put, we put on our outlook in December, like most banks do, um, we look at the various scenarios of what might happen to the US economy and what it might do to the gold price, um, and we've been completely surprised by this move. Our models have not been able to capture what's been going on. But if you look at the composition of the gold market, you can get some, uh, a better idea. The first thing I'd say is, what's driven gold since the start of March? Well, very straightforward. COMEX trading speculators went from very small positions, net long gold, to about as large net long positions we've seen since COVID. There were bigger positions, as you can see from the blue bars on this chart, prior to COVID, 
but the liquidity in the COMEX market is not what it was prior to COVID because of that huge dislocation that took place between uh, the COMEX futures market and the OTC market in London. So we've seen a lot of buying in a short space of time. The gold price has gone up a lot. Fine. So is this just a technical move? Well, no, it's not. Because this technical move could not have happened without some of the other factors that have taken place. I've spoken about one. That one, over the last two years, has been this incredible increase in central bank purchases. But there's other stories as well. One thing that certainly isn't helping gold is gold held in exchange-traded funds. ETF holders in North America and Europe have sold gold for the last three years, over the full year. You'll see the changes taking place here. You can see the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine back in early 2022. Yes, but gold did get bought, but it was sold afterwards. In general, light selling coming through from ETFs each year over the last three years. This has not been a positive factor, but I'll come back to that. But China demand has been strong. This is the thing that's helped gold over the last four or five months. It represents the turnover of gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange of physical gold. So this is not a futures market, which is cash settled or rolled. You buy gold on, the, on uh, four nines contract on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, you take physical delivery. This is the feedstock for the jewelry market in China. It's the feedstock for the investment market in China. And the volumes that we saw in January were off the charts. They fell. OK, Chinese New Year, fair enough. Then the gold price was quite a bit higher, fine. But guess what? They started to increase again this last week. Really strong evidence coming through of insatiable, I would almost describe it, demand in China. Jewelry demand is strong. Investment demand is stronger. They're also prepared to pay about a $50 an ounce premium in China for gold over the London price. So they're committed to buying decent volume. They're prepared to buy, buy decent prices. So why are they doing this? You probably all know. The Chinese real estate market, which is basically where people used to save and invest their money, has, had, has turned really poor. Volumes are down, prices are down further, the confidence has gone out of a real estate market, which has been the main place where Chinese individuals have been investing money. The equity market's been weak. The currency's weak. Where do you put your money? This is the country that saves almost the highest proportion of income in the world. Where are they putting their money? The places they used to put their money aren't working for them anymore. They're beginning to turn to gold. So Chinese retail demand for gold from the probably about November, December last year, right the way through till yesterday and today, has been a major factor in the gold market as well. So where are we? I think we need to recognize gold has held up really well over the last few years, despite high interest rates, despite a strong US dollar. Most elements of gold demand are in either a good shape or a reasonable shape, perhaps with the exception of ETFs. We'll probably see a bit weaker jewelry demand this year because the price is so high. And there's no doubt that elevated interest rates and cost of living pressures are affecting physical demand in some important markets, particularly Europe. Bar and coin demand in, Euro in Germany down 90% last year. It didn't turn up in the global figures because Asian emerging market demand compensated for that. But Germany is weak. Switzerland is weak. The United States physical demand has weakened. But despite that weakness, the strong central bank buying, OTC buying, and this is primarily high net worth family office buying that we're seeing out of Asia. I've been to Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand six, seven times in the last 18 months, and I have been overwhelmed by the interest from rich people looking to hold gold in physical form outside of China, outside of Hong Kong, outside of Singapore in many cases. And then finally, this China retail surge. All of these things have offset the macro factors. What's driving this? 
inflation, geopolitics, move to a multipolar world, sanctions resistance, weakness in the Chinese markets, and then, as I say, the recent COMEX speculative buy has taken gold to all-time highs, a series of all-time highs. So where's who's next? We're still in the camp that US interest rates will fall. We've been waiting. We've been waiting for the recession as well, which I personally do expect to see coming, although it keeps getting pushed out. But either way, interest rates should come down at some point. That's generally good for gold. The near-term risks, though, and this is something that I think that we should all be aware of, when the futures market grabs gold by the scruff of the neck and drives it higher in the space of a few short weeks, once that buying stops, there is a risk of a correction. Now, we're not talking about collapsing gold or anything like that, but it's gone up a lot very fast. That often doesn't stick. The second half of the year, geopolitics and increasingly US politics are going to become probably the biggest theme in the gold market. Um, it's going to cause volatility, and depends who wins the next election, we could be in line for very gold-supportive factors over the next few years. I put this chart in my presentation about two or three months ago. You can see how gold was tracking the expectations of where the Fed funds rate would be at the end of the year really well, and see how that line has broken away. This is, to me, the potential vulnerability here. We've seen gold go up an awful lot. We've seen interest rates in the US, expectations there increasing. So just be a little cautious here. Now, Patrick specifically asked me to speak about gold equities. I, uh, the World Gold Council doesn't talk about gold mining companies. We're owned by gold mining companies. And three of my owners are sitting in the room and spoke earlier today. So this is a personal view. <laughs> I have 38 years experience in gold. It's why working in the gold mines in South Africa a long time ago. I had to take my hearing aids out before I could talk tonight so they could get these in there. Um, I've been doing this a long time. And I've invested, I've been a gold equity analyst. I've invested in gold mining companies too. So th these are my thoughts. Very similar in some areas to what uh, you've heard already. So why have gold equities failed to respond? And what I would call the old arguments or the ones we hear a lot, and there's a lot of truth in them, the cost inflation we heard. Costs went up a lot when the gold price was going up during COVID. So you didn't get the margin expansion. Capital allocation. There were a lot of poor deals done in the last cycle. A lot of people were disappointed by the performance of gold equities in the bull market we saw in 2009, 10, 11, etc. One thing I think is also important, too, is size and relevance. Total market cap of the gold sector now must be in the order of, and I haven't looked recently, $400, $500 billion. So a quarter of the size of Apple. If you look at the entire materials allocation within the US equity market, it's a few single, low digit single percentages. You can afford not to pay as much attention to it. It's much more important to get your call right on the big seven. Gold is a complicated industry, it's a complicated commodity. Materials are difficult. And, and I think that there is a risk that the gold mining equities have got too small to be noticed by many generalist funds. And the specialized funds, the gold equity funds that used to exist in quite a lot of numbers in North America, many of those have gone too. And then finally, I'd say there's been a lack of big wins for the very small companies and the exploration companies. It's hard now for explorer co's and juniors to raise cash um, because the sector's out of favor. It hasn't delivered any real stonking great headlines recently. But I think other factors may be more relevant. Think back to what I've said about gold demand, why gold prices are higher. Look where gold demand has been strong. Central banks, Chinese retail, Asian high net worth, emerging market coin and small bars, and then latterly COMEX futures. None of those are a natural buyer of gold equities. And look where gold demand has been weak. North American ETFs, European ETFs, Western coin and small investment bars. And also note that silver, until very recently, has been underperforming gold. And that's typically a sign that, in, that Western investors aren't really paying that much attention to precious metals. So the traditional buyers, I think, of gold equities, the North Americans, the European people that are turning to, to gold and precious metals, 
on the basis of what they're doing in bullion, they're not really paying a huge amount of attention. I don't think it's a big surprise that the equities haven't really been performing. So what could make this change? And we've heard a couple of these things from uh, the speakers earlier. The historical example I like to think of is 2016. And 2016 I thought was really interesting, not because I got fired, which I did later in the year. Uh, <laughs> Hey, I got to work at the World Gold Council, so it can't be too bad. Um, but the gold price started going up uh, at the beginning of 2016, and it went up quite fast. And it went up fast, and it caused the analysts that forecast gold to increase their gold price forecasts, and the, the equity analysts that use those commodity forecasts to increase the earnings forecasts and expectations of those companies. Quantitative-driven hedge funds notice these the, all these equity upgrades coming through, started buying gold shares. Gold shares did really, really well in, uh, uh, in 2016, um, depending on which index you're looking up, up 50, up 70, up 100%. Now, we're now seeing these gold price forecasts come through. Um, I get most of the research from the banks, UBS, JP Morgan, HSBC, etc. They're starting to have to increase their forecasts because like us, gold has exceeded the expectations that we put out at the beginning of the year. That could be part of the trigger. The next one will be company forecasts, company first quarter results. Because in the first quarter, as, as one of the speakers said, I think it was Amar, said, the increase in the gold price is dropping down to the bottom line. The cost inflation that deviled the industry a couple of years ago has receded tremendously. Once analysts get confidence that the higher gold prices that they're now forecasting will turn into higher earnings estimates, they could start increasing their forecasts. We could see the same again. Now, what am I looking for to see a genuine change in sentiments towards the community that naturally buys gold? Three things I'm looking at. North American exchange-traded fund flows, and to a certain extent, Europe, but particularly North American ETF flows. ETF investors sold gold around the world in March, but at a much reduced rate. We've seen inflows and outflows this month. We saw 166,000 inflow yesterday uh, in North America. So there are signs potentially that this turns around. Similarly, US coin sales. They're not big in terms of tonnage or kilograms, but they're an important judge of sentiment. If we start to see an improvement coming through in the US mint sales, I'll pay attention uh, to that a lot. And then finally, gold-silver ratio. Can silver start outperforming gold? Because if silver starts outperforming gold, you will get the, the, the good vibes towards the precious metal space that will encourage people to look at gold in Western markets and potentially at gold equities as well. I hope I don't get fired for that section on gold equities. But thank you very much. I'm more than happy to take Q&A. And, and I'd say one thing, ask me anything, but please don't make the first question about Bitcoin. I will answer questions about Bitcoin, but when it's the first question, it's just going to annoy me. No, Bitcoin first. Yeah, question down there. Yeah. Can you listen, the Swiss National Bank has been acquiring euros and all kinds of currencies. Why haven't they started buying gold? They sold gold at 440 US dollars an ounce. Why would they want to buy gold at 2,200 dollars an ounce? Do you think it might show that, that they've actually made a mistake? <laughs> per we capita, that... Switzerland has the highest reserves of gold per person out of any of the central banks. Um, and they have a high proportion of their international reserves, not their balance sheet, but their international reserves in gold. I would never say to somebody that you've got enough gold but you, you would be tempted to say so in the case of Switzerland. They have a high proportion of, uh, of gold in reserves. Awkward, yeah. Pascal? So you touched on it. Um, so the ETF um, inflows are maybe coming back, uh, but uh, it's only small now. What do you think it could be the real catalyst for that picking up also in, in Europe? Is it an equity crash, or what, what would really Look, lead equity, to... Uh, OK, yes. an equity crash would be good for gold. It wouldn't be good for everything else, but it would be good for gold, because it always is. We heard today that, you know, in the corrections that have... And I think the, the numbers you said, Amar, the, the, the corrections were 35%, gold's outperformed by 45%. 
Yeah, so an equity crash would be good for gold. Um, put that to one side, because I've been waiting for that for a while, personally, but uh, without success. Um, lower interest rates will help. One of the reasons why people don't buy gold is because you can earn 4 or 5% on your cash balances. The opportunity cost of owning uh, something which is a, a non-yielding asset is high. It's one of the reasons why typically gold goes down when interest rates go up. It hasn't happened this time, but when interest rates go down, I expect we'll see more buying. Um, I think it also varies from market to market. European demand for gold, bars and coins, and ETFs, I think has really been hurt by the cost of living squeeze. Energy price increases, inflation is quite high. The, the typical buyer, the typical German buyer of, of, uh, of investment bars and coins isn't a super rich person. He's, he's like a, you know, mod, and it's a he, because it almost always is, and he's almost always old. Um, they, they've seen their, their, their income squeezed. And also, other buyers in Germany have been selling gold back because they, own, they bought gold because they couldn't get any interest on their savings and they put it in gold, it's done them very well, now they can get interest. So it's back to the, uh, that argument. In the United States, I think it's a different story. The US economy is doing well. The US equity market's doing really well. Um, when, when the S&P 500, particularly the, the big names in it, are performing really well, you don't think you need a hedge. Who needs a parachute when you can fly? Um, maybe we need to see a few air pockets coming through. I don't think an equity crash is necessary. I just think perhaps this surge in equities and the economy in the United States, if that were to falter somewhat, then I think, and with lower interest rates as well, I think that might see a return to, to ETF buyers. But it could simply be driven by price performance. If gold keeps powering higher, and if silver keeps powering higher, and gold and silver get on the news, rather than just talking about what hiccup NVIDIA has had this morning or whatever, then, then, it, then it will raise those prospects potentially. Time for one more question. Yeah, I'm coming. It can be Bitcoin now. <laughs> I already got my answer. What's more powerful for China, holding US treasuries or, ho using, or holding gold? Powerful. Um, well, I mean, it's an interesting one. Holding lots of treasuries gives you power because you could sell them. Um, holding lots of gold insulates you from sanctions if you are worried about falling, uh, falling foul of Western sanctions. So I guess it depends which way you put it. In the end, China only has declared 4% of its reserves in gold. Maybe it sees itself as the replacement reserve currency you know, in a Chinese time horizon, so a, f a number of decades. And maybe they look at the 8,500 tons of gold that the US has as a target. It wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. John, thank you very much. Thank you.